Thank you, Tom. Thank you for ministering so well to us. Um, I'd like you to take your Bibles and open the book of Romans, the book of Romans. And we are in Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, if uh, you don't have a Bible with you, there's one available on the pew in front of you or behind you, if that's the case. If that's the case, Romans chapter 8, and we're going to be reading from Romans chapter 8 in, in just a moment. Um, I, I actually picked up a commentary this week on Romans chapter 8. Uh, the, the guy who writes the commentary says it's, it's the greatest chapter in, in all the Bible. And, and he's not alone. There, there are a lot of people who believe that Romans chapter 8 is indeed the greatest chapter in, in the Bible. And if you're familiar with Romans chapter 8, you know there's, there's a lot of beautiful, wonderful memory verses in it. It's full of rich theology. It's, it's full of testimonies about how the Holy Spirit works in our lives. It's, it's, a, it's a chapter of great comfort. And, and with any chapter that's exalted in such a way, theologians want to kind of make their mark, and, and so they debate about Romans chapter 8. Is, is Romans chapter 8 about the Holy Spirit? Well, of course it's about the Holy Spirit. You read cha- Romans chapter 8, it's full of talking about the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit works in the lives of his people. And then there are others who say, well... If you read Romans chapter 8, it starts off with that wonderful passage, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And it ends with, what can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus? And so you you might look at Romans chapter 8, and and there's some who say, it's not about the work of the Holy Spirit, it's about assurance. It's about how we as God's people can know beyond a shadow of a doubt that we belong to God and we are loved by Him. That's what Romans chapter 8 is about. So some of you are saying, well, Pastor Robert, what do you think? My answer is, yes. But my, my answer is, I don't, I don't think we need to pick and choose on whether or not Romans chapter 8 is about assurance or about the Holy Spirit. I, I think one of the ministries of the Holy Spirit is to bring assurance. So it's, it's not a, either or, or it's both and. And that's something, that's something that I want you to have. I, I want you to be able to leave this place knowing that you're a child of God. I, I want you to be able to sing, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine! Without doubting that in your heart. I, 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 want, you, I want you to say that with confidence and conviction. I, I want you to know that God loves you like, like a son and know that you are his and he is yours. Don't, don't you want that? that's what I want for you this morning. So so that when somebody comes up and asks you, so hey, are are you a Christian? I don't want you to say, I hope so. I I, I don't want you to reply, I'm trying. I want you to say, yes, by God's grace I am. And and so that's my hope and my aim this morning, is, is that you'll find that assurance in these words of Romans chapter Eight, particularly verses 14 and 16. But, but we're actually going to start by going back just a little bit to Romans 8, 12, and we're going to read through verse 17. So Romans 8, uh, Romans 8, verse 12 through 17. If you're able this morning, will you stand for the reading of God's word? Therefore, brothers, we have an obligation, but it is not to the sinful nature to live According to it, for if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Because those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For, for you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father, the the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if if we're children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. This is God's word. You may be seated. Okay, so 
So, so let me just remind you, for those who, who may have missed a, a week or two, what we've already seen in Romans chapter 8 from, from the beginning. First, in, in Romans chapter 8, we've, we've been shown that we have a new status, that, that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So, so we can't be condemned because Christ was condemned on our behalf. So, so we don't have to live under this fear that God's going to somehow condemn us. We, we, we have a freedom. We have, we have a new identity. Not only is there now this new status of no condemnation, we have this new identity that's wrapped up in our relationship with Christ. Just, just like for those of you who are married, married marriage is this life-altering, paradigm-shifting relationship that affects everything. Right? You, you might have lived like a bachelor before you got married, but you better not be living like a bachelor after you get married. It's not going to make your marriage last. So too, our our, our new identity in this relationship with Christ Jesus is is one that shifts our paradigms and and changes us. Not only do we have a new status and a new identity, we have a new freedom from from the law of sin and death. The law can no longer condemn us like it once did. We're we're free from it. We, We don't have to be afraid of death because we know death needs to life. We have a new status, a new identity, a new freedom. We have a new mind that's now set on the Spirit's desires. We have a new presence. The third person of the triune God, the the Holy Spirit, actually lives within us. We have a new hope in in the resurrection of our bodies. So so our hope isn't just, well, if, if I... If I just keep going to the gym and if I keep eating my veggies and if I t- don't drink too much or smoke too much, I'll, I'll live. No, you're still going to die. But in Christ, we have the promise that the Spirit who raised Christ from the dead will raise us from the dead and we'll get new bodies. I'm in Gal- when Christ returns and I am resurrected, I will have a better body than I could ha- ever have if I spent years at the gym. Not only do we have this new hope, we have a new battle. And, and we, we talked about this quite a bit, but, but I want to hone in on it just a little bit more. We talked about this last week, about this new battle, the, the battle of putting to death the deeds of the flesh. So, so this is what we looked at last week. Look at verse 13 of Romans chapter 8. Um, if you live according to the sinful nature, you'll die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body. So, so we're going to put those things to death. We're going to fight those things. The, uh, the Greek word we looked at, thanatete, which, which is where the, the Marvel writers came up with Thanos' name, right? Thanos is the guy who puts people to death with a snap of a finger. This is what we're to do. We're, we're to mortify, the old King James says, our sin mortify the deeds of the flesh. So, so we don't keep Pet pythons, right? Those things will kill you. No, we, we put to death our sin. As John Owen famously said, we must be killing sin or it will be killing you. So if, if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Because those who are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. And this brings us down to this morning's message, which is in bold on your sermon outline. We, we have this new spirit, this new spirit of sonship that will lead us. A spirit who will lead us. Now, now most of the time, when people talk in, in our Christian world about the leading of the spirit, we're talking about kind of the subjective guidance and, 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 and that, that we're looking for. The, the spirit leading us to, um, to take this job or that job. The spirit leading us to, to, to find the right mate or go to the right school or buy the right house or end up in the right neighborhood. And, and it's entirely appropriate for us to, in prayer, ask God in his providence and by his spirit to lead and guide and direct us. That's, that's something we should do. But the kind of leading that Paul is talking about here is not that kind of leading, and I'll show you why. Look at verse 14. It says... Because those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. It doesn't just say those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. It says because those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. It it, it says because. The the word because is a a conjunction, a word that ties one thought to a previous thought. So some of your Bible versions might say for instead of because or since instead of because. So 
so what the text is saying to us is that the kind of leading it's talking about is a leading to put to death the deeds of the flesh. It's, it's a leading to fight sin. So, so one of the ways the Holy Spirit assures us that we are truly His is there's this desire in us to mortify the deeds of the flesh, to wage war against sin, to kill it. If, I'm, I'm convinced the way to understand this verse is like this. Those who are led by the Spirit of God to fight sin are sons of God. Let me ask you, are, are you in the fight? Do you care about mortifying sin in your life? Are, are there times in your life, just, are there times in life when you're watching something on TV and a show or a movie takes a turn? Let me just put it that way. And you know that this isn't heading anywhere good. This isn't going anywhere that's going to be edifying to you. This, this isn't, uh, maybe the Spirit brings to mind that wonderful passage in Philippians 4.8. Whatever's true, noble, right, pure, lovely, whatever's admirable, if anything is excellent and praiseworthy, think on these things. And what's on your TV screen right now is not that thing. Uh, do you just wait it out and hope it gets better? Or do you turn from it? Are, are, are there times when, when your anger is welling up within you and the Spirit brings to mind the, the wrath of man doesn't work, the righteousness of God, and, and, and you cry out to the Lord, help me, look God, help me, give me the self-control I need right now? Or do you just say to yourself, you know what, I'm going to feel better if I just get it all out. Are you being led by the Spirit to fight sin? Friend, if, if you are, rejoice and be glad because this is the one of the ways by which the Spirit of God assures you that you are indeed a child of God. But friend, if, if you have made peace with your sin, I'm not sure you can have that same assurance. For you did not receive, verse 15, For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship. This spirit, the Holy Spirit, is a spirit not of slavery to fear. Again, I I think it's talking about assurance here. There there are a few types of fear that Paul may have been tapping into. So he, he uses the language of slavery to make a point that, that fear can be enslaving. You guys know this. You guys know how, how enslaving it can be. I, I used to remember when I was a little kid and I was afraid of dark and I, I had to have the door cracked or I had to have a light on or I, I couldn't I was afraid of the dark. I, I had to have that light on. There were almost certainly in the congregation of the church in Rome, to whom which Paul was writing to, there were almost certainly slaves. And slavery was, even though it looked different from the ethnic slavery on the plantation that we saw here in in the southern states of these United States in the past century, I guess two centuries ago now, that current of fear was just as real. The historian, um, one historian writes, whips, the hook, the cross, these were the basis of the Roman slave system that everyone knew. And, and, and so Paul uses this language of slavery to paint fear as a slave master. Now, the fear that he may have been tabbing into here might have been, so you've got to remember, church at Rome, you've, you've got two groups, you've got Former Gentile, well, Gent, Christian Gentiles and Christian Jews. So you've got Christian Gentiles who, who used to, in all likelihood, be pagan. And he might be tapping into some of those fears of how, how uh, those Gentiles used to think of the Roman gods, which were capricious in the way they acted toward their people. Plutarch writes in the first century, he says, of all kinds of fear, the most impotent and helpless is superstitious fear. So, so, 
Again, these Christian Gentiles in the congregation would have remembered what living under that kind of fear was like. That, that Zeus or Apollo or Mercury might, might just decide to pick on you that day. Now, now, the Christian Jews in the congregation would have remembered another kind of fear, the, the fear of, of, of being condemned by the law for not living up to it, right? Paul's already made it clear through the book, book of the Romans so far that through the works of the law, no one will be justified. Some of them surely would have remembered being, uh, being not only ethnic Jews, but religious Jews and afraid of not living up to God's requirements. But, but this spirit that we now have as believers, as children of God, isn't a spirit that terrifies us. We, we don't walk around in suspense about God's verdict on us. It, 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 we're not crippled in fear over whether or not God loves us or accept us or will accept us. We're, we're, we're not... Um, There's some who've joked about what's called a daisy theology. You ever picked a daisy? You you might have in your mind the the picture of the young woman contemplating uh, a a young boy she's affectionate about picking up a daisy. He loves me. He loves me not. He loves me. He loves me not. We don't do that with God. We we don't have to do that with God. We don't have to, 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 to live in the fear that that will end on he loves me not instead of on he loves me. No, the spirit is not a spirit of slavery to fear. Rather, it's, it's a fear banishing spirit. The Holy Spirit's powerful enough to banish your fears of, of rejection and your fears of failure and your fears of loss and your fears of insignificance and your fear of the future. Christians, don't be afraid. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world, right? I mean, the, the Bible talks about a lot how we shouldn't be afraid. I, I saw a meme on Facebook that said, the Bible says, fear not 365 times, once for every day of the year. I did some research. It's not true. It, it says it like 70 times. But 70 is a lot. That's at least once a week, right? The, the point is there's a lot. And so Christian, if you're struggling with fear, lean into the Spirit. Remember who you are. We're not called to be cowards. The, the way we fight these fears is in the power of the Spirit. Being who we are and whose we are. For verse 15, you did not receive a Spirit that makes you a slave again to fear. But you received the Spirit of sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. This is, this is a spirit that has to be received. Not everyone is a child of God. Remember what it says back in John 1.11? Speaking of Jesus, he came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become Children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, nor of a husband's will, but born of God. Jesus has to be received. And when you receive Jesus, you receive his spirit. Not everyone is a child of God. Not everyone goes to heaven. Jesus said to some of the Pharisees, you're of your father, the devil. We were all created by God, but not everyone is a child of God. In order to be a child of God, you need to receive Christ. You you need to believe the gospel. You need to believe the good news of what Jesus has done. So if if you're here this morning and and you're not yet a follower of Jesus Christ, please listen carefully because this will help you understand. This, This will help you understand what Christianity is really about because it's in what Jesus did for us in our life in his life, death, and resurrection that that we find our identity. And if you're here this morning and you are a Christian, don't tune this out because this is what's going to anchor you throughout your days and your weeks and your years. The, The world in which we live in is broken. We are responsible for that brokenness. It, it was broken by our first father, Adam. And because man had done this, it, it was only fitting that a man 
would fix it. But, but we couldn't. We're, we're all sinners. I have a friend who's reading through the Old Testament, and he's like, dude, this is a mess. I'm like, yeah, that's the point. We couldn't save ourselves, let alone save the world. And so God, in his mercy, sent a second Adam, his own son, Jesus Christ, to undo what the first Adam had done. He, he lived a life of perfect obedience, always trusting in, in his heavenly Father. He, and, and this sinless, perfect, always trusting life was offered as a sacrifice for us. He, he went faithfully to the cross where, where he became an atoning sacrifice, a sacrifice that takes away sin so that we could be reconciled to God through faith in him. So, so by, by trusting in what he's done for us and his life, his death, his resurrection, which was proof positive that God accepted his sacrifice, um, we, we are brought into his kingdom. So, so, so Christ's sacrifice was not just a noble act of courage. It accomplished something on a cosmic scale. It was a condemnation banishing sacrifice. A sacrifice that offered forgiveness and reconciliation to all who would place their faith in it. And if, if you have yet to do that, do that today. And if you've already done that, rejoice and remember that he is yours and you are his. Now, this spirit of sonship, look at verse 15 again. You've received the spirit of sonship by which we cry, Abba, Father. I, I want to be sensitive because I know every time I, talk, I speak the word Father and I associate it with God, it brings memories to all of your mind. Some of you had a father that was like Ward Cleaver. Some of you had a father that was like Al Bundy. Most of us had fathers that were somewhere in between. Right. So some of you lost your dad at an early age or, or, or maybe he, he just wasn't ever around. And, and when you hear the word dad or father, it's still painful to you. And, and yet one of the ways God has shown himself to us in his word is in, in this picture as, as our father. And, and I believe the reason there's so much fatherlessness, I believe fathers are so, the reason fathers are so ridiculed in the media and TV is, is because Satan would like nothing more than for you to recoil at the mention of the word father. So, so I want to ask you right now that when I talk about God as your heavenly father, I want to ask you to lay aside those, those feelings or those bitternesses or resentments that you might have toward your earthly father and lay those at Jesus' feet because I, I don't want to let the sins of your earthly father get in the way of you hearing what your heavenly father wants to speak to you from his word. We've received a spirit of sonship and by him we cry, Abba, Father. The, the Christian faith is not about moral improvement. It's about divine transformation. The Christian faith isn't about moral improvement. It's about divine transformation. It's not about God coming to us and say, hey, shape up, do better. I might love you if you do. No, it's about God calling us to himself and adopting us as his children and transforming us to be chips off the old block. This is, this is divine transformation that comes through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, Christ is the Son of God by nature, the only one, the only begotten Son. We are sons of God by adoption. And, and, and ladies, based on this larger passage, I think it's clear, and all the commentators agree with me, that the Apostle Paul is including you in that category of sons and God, sons of God. Now, you might say, but we're women. He knows, I know. But the reason he uses this term son of God, and it plays into what we'll see later on next week, is that in, in the Greek society in which Paul was writing, it, it's the sons that were the heirs. And, and he wants you to understand that you get that too. You get the inheritance that's promised to all the males as well. 
Sons were the ones in Hebrew and Roman culture who were the heirs who had the privileged status. So, so ladies, don't feel slighted here. You should feel privileged and exalted. This is, this is what Tim Keller says about adoption in the first century. He says, adoption was a much more customary legal procedure in Roman society than it was in Hebrew or Near Eastern culture. So as a Roman citizen, uh, the people in Rome would have been familiar with it. Adoption usually occurred when a wealthy adult had no heir for his estate. He would then adopt someone as an heir. Could be a child, a youth, or even an adult. The moment adoption occurred, several things were immediately true of that new son. First, old debts and legal, legal obligations were paid. Second, he got a new name and was instantly heir of all that his father had. Third, his new father became instantly liable for all his actions, his debts, his crimes, etc. But fourth, this new son also had new obligations to honor and please his father. And all of this lies behind this passage here. So, some of you, anybody seen Ben-Hur? Do you remember that Ben-Hur was adopted? Remember the general Arius who he saved during the shipwreck? He, He actually adopted him and gave him a new name. Claudius adopted Nero. That was a bad adoption. Caesar Augustus was adopted as well. And and now, remember I said that Christ is the Son of God by nature, and we are the sons of God by adoption. But but this passage shows us that there's an added component to our adoption besides God simply... The correct way of saying this would be that Christ is the Son of God by nature. We are the sons of God by supernature. Because God gives us His Spirit in the adoption prospect. And, and, and this is the other aspect of our assurance that we belong to God. The first is that we're led by the Spirit to fight sin. The second one that's listed here is that we have this experience of God dwelling in us to help us look to God, to see God as Father. The spirit by which we cry, Abba, Father. Listen to how Spurgeon talks about it. He says, How great is the Father's love to his children? That which friendship could not do and mere benevolence would not attempt, a father's heart and hand must do for his sons. They are his offspring. He must bless them. They are his children. He must show himself strong in their defense. If an earthly father watches over his children with unceasing love and care, how much more does our heavenly father, Abba Father? We, we, we have a new guest with us. Matt and Danielle have brought into the world a second child. And, and, and I noticed how, how when their new baby was crying, Danielle came out and, and waved to Matt. Matt, you, you, you need to come take care of Caleb. Because that's what fathers do. When we cry out, this is what our Father does. He hears our cry and He responds to them. And and this, friends, this is revolutionary. You want to know what one of the big differences between the Old Testament and the New Testament is? Old Testament saints, if you read through the Old Testament saints, the Old Testament saints, they never call on God as Father. Yet in the New Testament, not only does Christ call on God as Father. He instructs his disciples when he teaches them to pray to say, Our Father. Because what Jesus has done for us in his life, death, and resurrection is he's made a way by which we could, by which not only would God not look on us as objects of wrath, but he would look on us as objects of his affection and adopt us as his sons and daughters. So we have received a spirit of sonship, but we cry, Abba. Father. Now, why does it say Abba, Father? Verse 15 could have just read, You received a spirit of sonship by whom we cry, Father. Why does throw Paul, Paul throw this Aramaic word in that? Here's why I think he's doing that. Um, some of you have reared children from a very young age and you know when kids first learn to talk they don't have a lot of words dada mama one of gracie's favorite words was baba baba was asking for her bottle right 
And, and so they, they make up language that's very simple, often one, syll- one syllable that's repeated twice. There's, there's not a lot of use of teeth in those words, right? Because they don't have teeth yet. And so the Aramaic Abba is probably closest to our English Dada. It's, it's a word that's gentle. It's, it's first words. It's helplessly and sometimes helplessly dependent. It's, it's a term of emotional intimacy. The, the, the child who cries dada knows his child is close by. My, my kids are teenagers. And so they don't, when they want something, they don't cry dada anymore. They come and negotiate, right? Hey, dad, if my, my room's clean and I'm getting straight A's, can I X? The baby, the infant, is the one who cries dada. And, and while we're called to grow up in Christ and... and, and Feast on the meat of God's word. I, I don't want you to ever grow out of that childlike stage, that dada like stage. I, I I want you to be able to sing not just in church but throughout the week. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. That sounds like the cry to Abba. You see, the spirit. He helps us see God as our Father, and He shows us that we can cry out to Him and lean on Him and depend on Him and trust Him. And by doing so, He testifies that we're God's children. The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Let me just close with these words from Octavius Winslow. He writes, The adoption of the believer into the family of God is so great a privilege involving blessings so immense for people so sinful and in all respects unworthy that no other witness would remove their doubts, quiet their fears, and assure them of their real sonship except their heavenly Father assure them by his own immediate testimony of truth. The eternal Spirit of God descends and enters the hearts as a witness to their adoption. He first renews our spirit, applies the atoning blood to the conscience, works faith in the heart, enlightens the understanding, and thus prepares the believing soul for the revelation and assurance of this great and glorious truth, his adoption into the family of God. Would you bow your heads in prayer with me this morning, Lord? I I pray there would be none who leave this place doubting they belong to you. Lord, would your spirit even now testify with their spirits that they're sons of God? And would that testimony be underscored with the desire in their hearts to fight sin and wickedness in their lives? Lord, so often we get so concerned about sin everywhere else, but we fail fail to look at it in our hearts and our minds. May may, may, May that not be the case for us. Lord, um, so, so grant us that assurance. And Lord, for those here this morning who might not yet be your followers, who might not, who, who so much of this sounds new and strange to, Lord, um, maybe even now you might be calling them to yourself. Lord, help them in eagerness respond to the call. Help them stir up within them faith and, and a desire to be free from sin. And to be certain that they have a Father in heaven. May they turn from their sin and trust in you. We ask these things in our blessed Savior's name.